I wanted to ask you, um, George, about today was the, so it's January 11th. Um, some of those who are watching this may see this tomorrow, but it's January 11th, and it was the first day of a two-day hearing at the ICJ taking Israel to The Hague. Uh, South Africa put in the application for this to enforce the genocide conventions. I don't know if you were able to follow any of the proceedings today. Uh, there were really high praises coming from all over the world around how this went for uh, 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 South Africa and, of course, those who are supporting South Africa, dozens of countries. What's your impressions of this and what is the significance of this uh, given the ongoing brutal war that Israel is engaged in in Gaza? Well, this was a red letter day, as we say, a day that will always be remembered when the Global South Step Forward Center stage uh, in world affairs and seized the attention of a global audience, except viewers of the BBC who didn't see a single minute of it. I watched every minute of it and read every one of the 84-page case that South Africa has made, which was, uh, in a word, irrefutable, uh, not least because they relied in considerable part on the televised words of Israel's leaders uh, themselves. Uh, they condemned themselves of the crime of genocide out of their own mouths, and their soldiers indicated that they had heard their leaders and helpfully videotaped themselves carrying out the genocidal orders. And many of those videos made it to the august uh, halls of the ICJ in The Hague today. Uh, Israel's defense uh, has already been mounted within a minute of the close of proceedings one Israeli minister accused South Africa of being the legal arm of Hamas, and another Israeli minister accused the court itself of being riddled with anti-Semitism, which gives you an indication of what they intend to say uh, in their defense tomorrow, even though uh, a blind man could see uh, it's no defense at all to cite what other people have done as a justification for your conduct as a signatory of the ICJ. Uh, the Genocide Convention is quite unusual, Danny, uh, in that both the United States and Israel have signed it and are bound by it. Uh, you know, the U.S. has never signed and joined the International Criminal Court, for example, the ICC, even though it's always trying to refer people to it, uh, it didn't join it itself and uh, indeed passed legislation in the Congress empowering the U.S. government to invade the Hague. Some of your viewers might think I'm making that up, but there's a U.S. law called the Invasion of the Hague Act, which empowers the U.S. government to actually invade the Netherlands and The Hague and the court to seize people uh, from it should it have the temerity to judge America's conduct. Uh, you really couldn't make that up, but it's absolutely true. So Israel is uh, indissolubly in linked and joined uh, with the Genocide Convention indissolubly bound by it, as is its chief armorer, funder, and diplomatic and political protection racket, uh, namely the government of the United States of America. So there's no getting out of this one. If the court, and I frankly cannot see any other outcome, makes a preliminary finding uh, that there is uh, cause for concern under the Genocide Convention and orders 
an, an injunction, you might call it, in, in legal terms, i.e. a temporary stay in uh, Israel's actions, what's called a cease and desist order. It seems to me impossible that the court can do other than that and then proceed to consider the uh, case uh, more deeply at more length. Uh, and if that happens, I argue, not everyone agrees, uh, that it will be impossible for Israel's backers to continue business as usual. Joe Biden's in an election year. Is he really going to fight an election in defiance of a finding on the Genocide Convention? I doubt that. He might even welcome it as an off-ramp, as an exit ramp from this highway of death that they are on. I can say for sure that no Western European government will be able to continue business as usual with Netanyahu in the event of such a finding, because to do so would place them in danger of prosecution in their own country, in cases brought by their own citizens, which could end up with them behind bars. I'm not exaggerating. So if the court finds in favor of South Africa, against Israel, all will be changed utterly. The whole world will be changed. And I believe for the better and I hope uh, for good. But even if for some undefinable, undiscernible reason, the court were to succumb to the insults and threats of Israel towards it, and reject South Africa's uh, moment today, uh, I still believe everything will be changed. Nothing will ever be the same again because you've no idea, I think, how the Palestinians felt seeing someone at the center of world attention, a foreign government speaking up for them in these clarion, crystal clear terms the lift that that gave them, the pride of the global south, that South Africa, which struggled so long and so hard for its freedom, was the agency of that moment. It was like Nelson Mandela coming back to life and standing there like a colossus bestride the uh, world, watching world and that will never be forgotten. I have a real feeling that this was a major turning point in world events today. Yeah, no, I mean, everything you say is is so important. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the uh, Hague Invasion Act uh, that the United States passed during the Bush II era in August of 2002. Uh, here it says uh, a human rights watch. This is absolutely um, just, I think, shocking probably to many. Uh, the new law authorizes the use of military force to liberate any American or citizen of a U.S. allied country being held by the court located in The Hague. It's dubbed the Hague Invasion Clause, which caused strong reaction from U.S. allies around the world, particularly in the Netherlands. So you are indeed correct, George. This is actually on the books. And now, ponder, your point, Danny, you know, Danny, ponder that for a moment. Not just any U.S. citizen, but the citizen of any U.S. ally. Ally. Yep. That means, uh, I don't want to put you in trouble by naming names, <laughs> but think of some of the U.S. allies. Think of the crimes that they have committed. Think of the possibility that they could end up before this court in The Hague and the U.S. Army will invade The Hague to spring them. I mean, it's a B-movie. It's, it's a Hollywood B-movie. It's the Dirty Dozen uh, squared. It, it's almost unbelievable. It's almost laughable. But it's true. It's U.S. domestic law, as you've just shown. 
Yeah, yeah, it is. And and your broader point too about the significance of this and how what South Africa has done, I think, has accelerated what I mean all the way back. We're talking over twenty years ago. This uh, it, it's it's like a quagmire. It's like a uh, it's like a trap that the United States cannot get itself out of. They're totally uh, dedicated the neocons, the foreign policy establishment, to backing Israel. And now uh, the world has this huge stage that South Africa has uh, so eloquently and heroically uh, uh, used for the Palestinian people. And, and it, I, I don't, it, maybe you can go over some of the scenarios. Let's say the courts do uh, a rule, the ICJ rules in South Africa's favor. What do you think would be the consequences? Because it's quite clear that Israel doesn't have much uh, uh, incentive to stop. But how could this change things? You said it would change things forever. How could it? Well, in Shakespeare's words, uh, the brave man dies only once. The coward dies many times before his death. And South Africa proved its bravery today. You can only imagine the kind of bribery and browbeating that South Africa has endured since late last year uh, when it came forward with this triggering of the Genocide Convention. And a measure of that is that no one else did it. No one else would do it. Everyone else was either afraid to do it, in the case probably of most Arab countries, uh, or in the case of Western countries, they were so, again to continue Shakespeare, so steeped in blood uh, that they had to ask, was it bloodier to go on or to go our? The fact that nobody else did it is testament to uh, the consequences, potential consequences of having done it. The editor of the Jerusalem Post today uh, promised to exact a price from South Africa for, for what they have done. We can only imagine what that price might be. But South Africa, with all its history, which is important for people to know, I happen to have had the honor uh, to play a small part in that liberation struggle. I actually left my blood on the floor of the Guguletu police station in Cape Town, South Africa, after a beating from uh, a white apartheid South African police officer. I was for decades involved in this struggle. I saw it triumph. And somehow today, I felt that Mandela was back amongst us that Joe Slovo was back amongst us, that the heroes, Ruth First, Albi Sachs, all of the latter, Jews, by the way, uh, were back amongst us. It was a moment of unadulterated joy for me to see the flag of free South Africa proving itself the only country that would bring this case. And then when we heard the case, saw the case, saw how irrefutable it is, saw that only a kangaroo court could possibly reject it, saw the unanswerable nature of the charges on the videos from the mouths of the Israeli leaders and their agents on the ground in Gaza, uh, it seemed like a dam had broken. The floodgates had opened and it will not be able to be turned back. Now, everyone knows that a country in the global south has rights and if it has the courage to exercise them, can cause tremendous problems uh, for the empire. And countries in Africa are proving that every day, you know, the country of Niger, a tiny country, uh, just nationalized its water supplies, ending 50 years of monopoly control over its drinking water by the colonial power 
France, Niger has already kicked the French armed forces out of its country. So has Burkina uh, Faso uh, and uh, all over the global south. Countries are realizing their power that uh, the great only appear to be great as long as the rest of us are on our knees. Well, South Africa is not on its knees. It stood up tall and showed uh, what can be done, what must be done if a new world is to be born. We are living in a time of monsters, to be sure. But those monsters are enfeebled. They can still kill. You know, Chairman Mao said the U.S. imperialism was a paper tiger. Well, it was a bit of an exaggeration, especially at the time that it was said. But my goodness, it's a paper tiger now. Iran just seized the oil tanker that America stole from them stole the oil from it and stole its name, renamed it St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, if you like. Iran just took it back in the Persian Gulf. What's America going to do about it? Nothing is the answer to that. The empire is a paper tiger. It is able to be challenged and when challenged, to be defeated. Your name is Hai Fong, very proud name. I'm so old, I saw the Vietnamese people rise up and defeat the most powerful empire that the world had ever seen. Men and women in sandals, men and women with only a Kalashnikov on their back, Men and women living and fighting in tunnels. People who fought the giant war machine of the United States and was victorious. Everything's changing. Everything is moving all the time. There is nothing as constant as change, as Marx said. And that change is now reaching qualitative tipping point. And the events in the Persian Gulf today and the events in The Hague today are luminous examples of that change. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. I was very lucky to be in Vietnam just a couple months ago and see just what victory can really bring. I mean, I mean, what you're describing, that's exactly what the Vietnamese people did. And uh, uh, now with peace, uh, the Vietnamese people have been able to accomplish things that uh, no one 50 years plus ago would have been able to imagine. Now, with this turning point with regard to Palestine, you know, I'm wondering if you could just share a few words of optimism about this, because I know both you and I, you've been in the uh, in politics and, of course, the broader political uh, movement for quite a long time um, and you've been doing a lot of coverage of what's going on in Gaza and what many people I know in the collective West especially in the United States where I reside there's a lot of um, uh, despair right there's a lot of that going on but with what's going on at the Hague as you said with what's going on at the Hague which with with what is going on in the region um, Talk about the optimism that perhaps uh, these recent events can really bring uh, uh, as we move toward what is, I believe, I totally agree with you, there is a turning point in this particular iteration of the conflict, and, and it seems like things are going to change forever. I, it, I'm young enough to not really have seen uh, wars mm -hmm. like Vietnam, even I was very young, even when Iraq was going on. But I've never seen, and it's hard to cite an example, where a country or an entity, I should say, like Israel was taken to The Hague by a country like South Africa, and it received this much support, this much attention, and this much pressure uh, on behalf of, of the Palestinian people. Well, uh, last night, uh, the arch-criminal Netanyahu 
was forced to go on television and speak in English. These people have a narrative, a discourse in English, and a, a, a different one in their own language. Uh, but he was forced to go on television last night and speak in English and state unequivocally that Israel has no intention of removing the Palestinian people from Gaza. This, of course, totally contradicts everything that they have said and done over the last almost 100 days. It contradicts every statement that has been made by high officials, right up to the president himself, Herzog. Uh, but Netanyahu was forced to state it and will not now be able to go back on it. So all this talk that they were going to be building a new settlement cities uh, on the uh, Mediterranean beaches uh, of Gaza, that they were going to dig a Ben-Gurion canal uh, through Gaza and uh, scupper the Suez Canal and Egypt, all this talk about sending the Palestinians uh, to the Congo, imagine, uh, and, and so on. All of that is now null and void because Netanyahu has been forced to state that it is not their intention to remove the Palestinians from Gaza. This is a very considerable victory. And just like the victory in South Africa, it has been won between the hammer and the anvil. The hammer of the armed struggle and resistance of the partisans in Palestine itself and the anvil of international solidarity, international immovability. And South Africa has shown itself uh, to be the bravest and the uh, most forthcoming of those. This is a considerable victory that should not be underestimated. But the Israeli withdrawal of almost all of their soldiers from the north of Gaza, without showing on a plate a single trophy that they have won there, without showing a single destroyed tunnel about which they cackle endlessly, without releasing a single one of their prisoners that are being held there, some of them prisoners of war, some of them hostages, uh, is a very considerable victory for the Palestinian people, who slightly better armed than the Vietnamese because of the passage of time, uh, but still just guerrilla fighters, partisans, uh, behind uh, enemy lines, uh, wreaking a terrible toll on the Israeli armed forces who don't like losses. You know, they're a small country, they're a small population. It's a conscript army. Uh, everyone has families and friends and workmates from whom they've been torn and sent into Gaza. Uh, the the killing of one of those soldiers is a big event in Israeli society. Uh, Ho Chi Minh said, uh, we know that you can kill uh, 10 of us for every one of you that we can kill. But in the end, we shall prevail. And that is also true in this conflict uh, in Gaza. Uh, the Israelis have withdrawn their troops, not because they've already won, but because they've already lost. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. 
For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash dannyhaifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much and I look forward to the next video.